Hello everyone and uh, welcome to U14 Soccer. I've made this presentation to help explain the 451 formation that we're going to be using this year. Now it's not only about the formation that we're using but it's also about the style and the system that we're going to be learning this year. It is very important in my opinion that when someone is learning a system or a style they not only know the hows as to where they have to be but why they have to be there and hopefully by the end of this that will all be explained um, it is going to take a little bit of time but please bear with me it starts off pretty simple with our four backs followed by our five midfielders then up front we have our one forward here's where things are going to get a little more complicated because there's two types of midfielders um, we have one group that we're going to call the halfbacks and they're going to work as the link between the back four and the front four. Then we have the attacking mids. They're still going to defend up front, but their job is more to put pressure on the opponent's mid and back four. Now, over the course of this presentation, I am going to be using these big X's to show the general area of where the players belong in formation and how it should look. Uh, at certain points in time it's going to look like they're really close together. Um, but if I were to move this to scale it would look something like this. So as you can see that is a big pitch and our boys have a lot of space to cover. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we're going to be playing a zonal style instead of man-to-man -man style. Uh, I'm not really going to show and animate the opponents. Uh, for one thing I tried it and it got very very confusing and for another because it's a zone system it's not really as important where they are as long as we're maintaining our zone coverage and that'll be explained a little bit further on so now we're going to talk about defending and I really hate to break this down into such simplistic terms as defending and attacking because realistically we're going to be playing defensively the whole time but this is how we're going to handle the more um, traditional idea of defending something like a breakaway attack from our left side the first and most important step is to force the player that's carrying the ball out to our wide back Now our, in this case, left back will isolate that player, uh, keeping them from being able to turn into the field towards the goal. Since the play is on our left, the left center back will stay just ahead of the ball and set the offside trap line. This is where the halfbacks come in. They move into position and create a second defensive line. The opposite side winger, in this case the right attacking midfielder, moves in and finishes off the second defending line. The same side winger, so the left attacking midfielder moves in and locks down that side. 
his job is to prevent any passes back to support players. At this point, we've isolated the attack and we've now choked them off. The center mid's job is to move back and create almost the point on the pyramid. Um, they're going to be in a position where any loose balls or bad passes they can sweep and get possession of. They're also one of the primary outlets um, for a counterattack or to start the counterattack. The forward also has a very important defensive job. Um, their job is to pin the backfield players of the opposing team. Uh, basically, they want to roll around and make them nervous and make them worry about the forward so that they're unable to commit themselves to the attack. That way, one player can hopefully prevent two or three other players from joining in against us and we'll have superior numbers defending. An attack on our right side will be handled the same way uh, only using our right side players so we'll be isolated by the right wide back and then the right center back sets the trap line so on and so forth um, it's going to be incredibly important that the wingers understand when they are supposed to be joining the halfbacks and when they are supposed to be isolating the play and preventing the back passes um, there's going to be um, times that we drop into a sweeper style backfield when we do that the only thing that changes is the wide backs now kind of slide in and halfbacks um, stay exactly where they are from halfbacks forward whether we're playing sweeper style or whether we're playing with the high line four nothing changes. As you can see there are a lot of moving parts there. Um, I don't think it's enough to just tell players that you go here and do that and you go here and do this other thing. I think each of them needs to understand the underlying principles of what they're doing so that they can work together and trust each other to do their job. The first part, and I think our players are very good at this, they need to understand that we're try trying to stop the play dead. Um, players are coming on with momentum and trying to just stop them would be ineffective. What we are really trying to do with this system of defending is to first control the opponent's attack and then we will try to contain their attack so that we can ultimately neutralize the attack. When we say that we're trying to control the attack, what we're really doing is trying to force the attack into a bad angle for them so that they're not any immediate danger to us. Once that's been accomplished, we move into the containing their attack. And we do that by covering their options um, and closing down their passing lanes so that there's really nowhere for them to go with the ball to mount a, a good counterattack. 
the last step in neutralizing the attack is to um, force the opponent to play through us. Uh, the whole time that they are working their way towards our backfield, I want them to feel as they are running uphill in the mud. They need to have to work hard, and I want our boys to work less so that we are fresher on the attack. Um, this way, they are under pressure constantly, and it gives them the opportunity to fail. And that way they will um, mess up passes or they make, make a mistake. When they make a mistake, then we capitalize on it and we take the ball and recover it. The offside trap. This is a tactic that our boys actually excel at. They're very, very good at it. But it's something that takes a lot of discipline. And that explains why I'm so picky in particular with my backfield and who gets to play in it and where. Because there are so many players on the field, it's incredibly important for just one player to set the trap line. Uh, there needs to be a very distinct line of sight for the assistant referee to see. So those players that are responsible for the trap line are the center backs. If the play is on the left side, it will be the left back's job to stay just ahead of the play and keep the trap line. And if the play is on the right side, that duty falls to the right back to stay just ahead of the play and set the trap line. No other player should be behind those trap line players except the goalie. This style of high line defense is very good at neutralizing long ball teams. And you've all seen it that when a lot of these teams are faced with a high line, their answer is to bomb the ball into our backfield and then turn it into a foot race to try to see which of us get to that ball first. Um, in that case, either one of our goalies is more than fast enough to come up, sweep that ball, and stop the attack. Once their players have been caught off sides a couple of times, um, in particular the alpha teams, uh, they start to second guess their runs and it slows their attack down. Uh, this is particularly important because it takes away one of their biggest assets, which is speed. The other part of that, which when that works right into our plan is that by them slowing down to form up an attack it allows our players to get into position and form. It gives us the time we need to then contain and neutralize their attack. You've all heard me say that soccer is high-speed chess. Um, that's to say it's very tactical, it's very strategic. It's also a brain game. And it, the offside trap is a great way to frustrate the opponent. Um, it takes them out of their comfort zone, forces them into playing more of our game where we will be able to dominate and it frustrates the parents and the coaches as well as I'm sure any of you can attest to on the sidelines. The offside trap rule applies from midfield all the way down to the goal line but we will not be trying to trap people all the way to the goal line. We're going to start at midfield and we're going to stop 
at about the, somewhere between 12 yards out and the 6 yard box. 12 yards out is the penalty kick area. Um, the reason for that is we just simply don't want to crowd our goalkeeper when their team is that close. And we want to watch uh, players that are higher in the box. So at that point, the two center backs will work a still be working zonal uh, in conjunction with the halfbacks to cut off anyone that is in the box itself. A technical tactical change that we've made um, and we started working on this the end of last year uh, is that now we are going to be playing out of the backfield. Um, since this is a possession style game, uh, we need to maintain possession, even when it is less than convenient to do so. The first rule to playing the ball out of the backfield is that whenever possible, we do not want to just clear the ball. Obviously, there are going to be times that we need to, and we need to get it out of there. Uh, but any opportunity that we have to keep the ball, rather than just sending it up and then having it be a 50-50 chance of us getting the ball, we want to keep that ball. We don't want to clear if we can avoid it. Now they're going to need to pass to the nearest open player. And that player might be behind them, that player might be inside the field, but it has to be the nearest player. Uh, mainly because we don't want that ball crossing too many of our opponents and giving them the opportunity to steal the ball. So you will have support players or players that are close to you and they're there for a reason it's so that you can pass it to them a very short crisp pass that's not going to get picked up. In order for those short passes to work you're going to need to be open in your position. Um, positional play is incredibly important not only because it helps us to control the field but it also makes it so that your players know where you are. Everyone on the field knows where to look for you for help. Um, when we were U8s and 10s I explained the positions as houses and so you don't get the idea that it's a specific spot on the field. Your position is a wide area, but it's still within that area you need to be, and you need to be sometimes coming back to be open for those passes so that we can start building the counterattack. Which brings us to attacking. Uh, we've outgrown the days of a player just getting the ball, running up the field, and scoring a goal. Um, even if we hadn't, that's just, to be honest, that's not good soccer. Uh, as we progress through the age groups and the divisions, it's going to become less and less common. So we need to have a unified system for attacking. So a breakaway run up the middle, be it through through ball or carried where you're one on one, one on one with the goalie is about as good as it's gonna get. Uh unfortunately that's not gonna happen very often. Uh more regularly the attack is going to be um a run up a side, we'll look at this as if we're going up of our, up our right side, that goes down the sideline and then curls inward towards the goal 
as the typical attack. So like I said, that is a more typical style of attack. However, there are some very real problems that come in when we try to employ that type of attack. The first problem with that attack is burnout. That field is very, very long and very big, and it's a lot of space for a single player to cover. Um, they, in whatever good shape they're in, uh, they try to make that run three or four times in a half, and it's going to wear on them, and they're going to be tired. The second problem, which in some ways is even worse than the first problem, is that we outrun our support. Uh, a lot of times a player sprints down the field and finds himself alone in the backfield uh, with no one to pass to because the rest of the team hasn't caught up to him yet. Uh, the third problem is that it clogs up the backfield. Uh, most teams are used to this type of attack because it is the most common style and they train against it and they prepare themselves for it and what ends up happening is that the backs will drop into a very very solid defensive position um, taking away our best opportunities at the net so with these problems in mind, what I'm proposing is that we learn to attack from the midfield. And what I mean by attacking from the midfield is that we want to maintain possession in the midfield and until we have an opportunity or a good opportunity at their goal. The first benefit of attacking from the midfield is simply a shorter run. Um, the player that's carrying the ball, if they notice that they're not alone in the backfield, they should just slow down and uh, hold up their run so they're not burning themselves out needlessly. Slowing the run, um, especially in order to keep possession of the ball and to keep a back from challenging the ball, is also going to slow the whole pace of the game down, which not only helps the player that's carrying the ball, but it helps all of the other players on our team uh, to maintain their stamina, and that should help to resolve the burnout issue. If we've shortened the run and slowed the pace of the game, that should give us the opportunity to get numbers forward so that that player that's carrying the ball uh, now has his support with him. Obviously this is going to happen simultaneously but I'm going to break it down player by player so that everyone understands what the individual jobs are. The forward will move into a position where they're ready for a through ball. The midfielders will move into a position where they are prepared to attack or an attack formation. The halfbacks, and I cannot state or overstate how important these players are to this overall system. Uh, they'll move into a position where they can both support and defend the midfielders who are playing up high um, to give them options both in back and inside the field. The opposite side back, so if the attack is on our left, it would be the right back will move in and essentially become the third halfback. So there's always really three halfbacks. They're just being drawn from a 
different side. When we're defending, it'll be the attacking wingers that become the third half back. And when we're attacking, it will be the um, wide backs that come up and fill in that second midfield line. The three remaining backs will now move up to a support position. So they will be supporting the halfbacks who are in turn supporting the midfielders who are working in conjunction with the forwards. So there's always options back. It'll be the backs, if they're under pressure, will be moving the ball back to the goalkeeper and performing a drop play um, to draw their forwards and midfielders into our backfield. This way we've built a supported attack. Um, it gives us the ability to both attack and defend simultaneously. Uh, if you want to think of it from a military perspective, we've basically built a fort in their territory. So the real beauty of this is that we've created a grid of short passes. And that takes up field and takes field away from them and gives us a lot of options as far as ball movement where we can move the ball away from pressure and into a better position for us to attack. By doing so, we can force their midfielders to defend. Now, while midfielders, their job is also to defend, they're not necessarily specialized in this. Uh, we're not engaging the backs who are better trained in defending. We're uh, going against their particular skill sets. This should also disrupt their formation. Um, so players will be moving as we, as we move the ball along player to player in the short grid. Um, they should be drawing players out of their position, uh, which should create openings for us to get through. But we have to be patient to, uh, recognize and capitalize on their lack of organization. Now, even though this formation looks very rigid on paper, in actuality, it's extremely fluid. Players are always moving back and forth um, into positions where they can be open and take time with the ball. Uh, over the course of that, as we move the ball through the formation, the backfield will move up to meet our attack. Um, that should open up the line for an attack in the backfield. So we'll be making a very short run at the goal. Um, we should be able to catch both the backs and the keeper off guard. And uh, if we can catch the backs moving forward towards our goal, that is the perfect time for through balls because it's extremely hard to readjust your direction. Now it's time to discuss the ideas and principles behind how we're attacking and uh, I thank you for your patience we're almost done first off uh, this is possession style soccer and the idea behind possession style soccer is that the team that has the ball has more opportunities to score if the opposing team has the ball more time they have more opportunities to score so we want to keep possession of the ball. And that might go against your gut instinct. Uh, it might mean 
turning away from an attack. It might mean moving the ball back, but doing everything we can to maintain possession. If we have possession, opportunities will present themselves. Patience. So this is one of those things. It's more of a mental game at this point than it is physical. Um, we have all the skills we need. We need to get our head straight. And part of that is being calm and patient on the pitch, under pressure. Uh, we don't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. We want to wait for, an, for the right opportunity. And sometimes that means holding up and waiting a little bit to have that opportunity present itself. So this part is absolutely vital. We need to move away from pressure. Uh, most of the time we want to go in, uh, take a one-on-one -on -one and beat the guy. Uh, unfortunately, every time you go into a one-on-one -on -one challenge, you run the risk of losing the ball. So you beat one one-on-one, -on -one, you beat the guy. Now you go in again, you got a 50-50 chance with the next guy. You need to move either yourself or the ball or both away from pressure. We need to go to those open players. We need to use our short grid. We need to keep that ball moving and have patience uh, and maintain possession. So a lot of times the best play is to simply run away. Play without the ball. Um... So to break it down like this, there are 22 players on that pitch at any point in time. Uh, there's one ball. So you have less than a 5% chance of being the player with the ball. So if you're not the player with the ball, what are you doing? That's the important stuff. That's where soccer is really played. Are you dragging players out of their position? Are you creating passing lanes? Are you opening up the defense? Are you getting open? That's far more important than what the guy with the ball is doing. He's occupied. He needs to do his job with the ball. He needs to have somewhere to move that ball. Your job, 95, more than 95% of the time, your job is to play without the ball. Conservative shooting. Uh, this is not something that we seem to have an issue with. As a matter of fact, probably the contrary. Uh, every time we shoot the ball and it doesn't cross the goal line, we've basically given the ball away. So that's, we no longer have possession. It'll either be a goal kick or the goalie will receive the ball and he will punt it. Uh, so we've lost the first and most important, one of the most important things, which is possession. It is, we're not going to have a 100% shooting um, percentage. It's just not going to happen. We're not, we're not going to have a 50% shooting uh, rate. I would honestly be happy with 25% of our goal of our shots going in net would be phenomenal. Uh, but we also don't want to go by a machine gun strategy of just sending the ball, sending the ball, sending the ball, and hoping that one goes in. We need to take good shots on net. That way we have a better opportunity. It only takes one goal to win a match. Uh, and whether we get whether we win one to nothing or seven to nothing, it still results in three match points when you look at the big picture. It changes the goal differential, but as far as match points, it's still three points regardless. Even if we tie 0-0, zero, zero, we're still getting one match point for that tie. So... In the big picture of it, and I know everybody wants to be the one to put the ball in the net, but in the big picture of it, we would rather pick and choose the shots that we take and use them wisely and economically.
Now that's the overview of both the formation and the system that we're going to be using and learning for the next two years. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that that's an easy system to learn. I'm not going to tell you that that's going to be an easy system to teach. But what it is, is a system that is designed or set up uh, to fit your particular skill sets, to fit your strengths. Um, it's also a system that is very adaptable. Uh, from this system, you can then change to whatever system you're going to be taught or asked of you, uh, be it in junior varsity, varsity, college, going on basically throughout your whole life. This system has all of the basic components that you're going to need to know for hopefully the rest of your soccer career. Uh, at least from a tactical perspective. We haven't even started to touch on the set pieces, the uh, corner kicks and free kicks and the springing free kick defense and things like that. Um, we're going to get through all those as, as the year progresses. But hopefully this brings at least a very overall understanding of what we're looking for this year. Go Panthers!